Wouldn't it be cool to just have a simple serial interface that we could connect to all of our peripherals? Turns out, we have one. Now, in previous lessons, we've talked about the asynchronous serial protocol, a point-to-point -point protocol that requires three wires, one for transmitting, one for receiving, vice versa for the other device, and a signal ground. Point to point, only one device. It also only allowed us to communicate with one character at a time. Put one character in a frame, add a couple of bits on either side in order to transmit that byte. Transmitting a whole bunch of bytes meant a whole bunch of frames. So we moved to the serial peripheral interface, which was much faster. The reason it was much faster? It was synchronous, had a clock signal. Clock signal required another wire. So now we have four wires, one to transmit, one to receive, one for our signal ground, and one for the clock. Very fast, but if we wanted to communicate to multiple devices, we needed to add additional signals, these things called chip selects. Those active low signals selected which one of the devices we were communicating with. Wouldn't it be cool if we could add address to those frames in order to identify exactly which peripheral we were communicating with? Turns out we do have that. And we have that in the form of a protocol referred to as the inter integrated circuit or IIC or what I'm going to call it I squared C or I2C interface. Now this interface allows us to go back to the original two lines that are required. We need, and, and it's slightly different. Remember with asynchronous we had a transmit and a receive. Now what we've got are two lines, one wire that is used for transmitting and receiving data. It's bi-directional and then we have a clock in order to communicate, in order to identify or synchronize the bits as they're being sent. So, now we're going to begin with the actual electronics. You know, back in, I think it was reading joysticks, buttons and switches using voltage dividers, we talked about this thing called an open collector circuit. Now the open collector circuit was based on this idea that I have some sort of a pull-up resistor going to some, I have a positive voltage, I have a pull-up resistor, and then I have a switch. Now, this point right here is going to be either equal to this pull-up voltage, this source voltage here, or equal to zero volts the ground, so a logic one or a ground, based on whether the switch was open or closed. If the switch is open, we're pulling up to the VCC. If the switch is closed, we're pulling down to the logic zero, to the ground, which represents a logic zero. Well, the, good th the cool thing about these, these open collector circuits is that you can actually put a bunch of these switches in parallel. And by doing that, we can determine, looking at the voltage level of this spot right here, so this is our signal, so looking at that voltage spot there, we can't tell exactly which one of the devices has closed the switch, but we can tell that a device has closed its switch. If you're familiar with logic gates, this is kind of like a, an AND circuit, where if any one of these is equal to zero, the output is equal to a zero. The only way that the output is equal to a one is if all the switches are open, all the switches are a logic one. All right. Now, the really cool thing about this, there, there's a bunch of things, but one of the things is that we can use this wire to allow any of the devices to communicate. It is what we refer to as a half duplex. Only one device can communicate at a time, but it's bi-directional, as opposed to the serial peripheral interface and the asynchronous serial protocol, which actually were full duplex. Since they had an individual wire for transmit and an individual wire for receive, they could both be used at the same time if the system was set up to be that way. Now, one of the other 
problems with the open collector circuit is that it doesn't have quite the range that a circuit that is driving its signal with a voltage level to represent a zero or a voltage level to represent a one, like RS-232. Serial peripheral interface, those ones can go farther. Those protocols can go farther physically than the uh, IIC or the I squared C. Now, the other thing is, is that since this signal level is either zero or not zero, you actually have a little bit of flexibility in terms of this voltage level here as detected by the receiving devices. So each one of the receiving devices is watching this wire, but basically what they're looking for is a zero or a not zero level. Now there are requirements, for example, when we talk about the Raspberry Pi, it really is looking for a 3.3 volt to be a logic one and a zero volt to be a logic zero. But some of the devices it communicates with may require a 3.5 volts or a, or, a, or a 4 volts or a 3.7 volts for them to register this logic one. So we do have some flexibility. Now let's talk a little bit about the protocol. Now, first of all, I can actually have multiple devices that are serving as controllers. All right, now a controller, its job is to communicate with peripherals. So I can also have a, I can have multiple peripherals. Now, I can communicate from any controller to any peripheral. The controller is what's going to start the communication. In other words, the peripheral can't just simply say, hey, I've got something to say, I need you to, to contact me or send data, uh, all, of the, all of the transactions, interactions are initiated by the controllers. So that's one kind of drawback, but once again, it gives us this ability to have multiple controllers and multiple peripherals on the same bus. There is also no way to communicate from controller to controller. That might be a problem, but really what we're looking for is to have any sort of controller being able to access data or information or send, access, send data or information to the peripherals. So let's talk a little bit about the protocol. Now, a frame includes eight bits followed by an, an acknowledgement bit. So we're going to have eight bits either address or data, and then an acknowledgement bit that whoever's receiving that information said, yep, I'm here, or yes, I got it, all right? So let's go ahead and divide this up into, let's see, that's, uh, we've got, uh, it looks like nine, and let's do it again. I think I put 10 there that time, didn't I? Nope, nine. All right, so now we're gonna look at the simplest protocol. Just, we're gonna just simply transfer a byte and notice that we can transmit more than one byte with this, with this transaction. But if we were just wanting to transmit a byte, we've got two minimal frames. We've got an address frame. Every transaction begins with an address frame. And then we've got a data frame. All right, now let's first look at what's the job on the, from the point of view of the controller. Uh, and in fact, I'm gonna erase this because I wanna put a clock signal right below this. So we've got two signals. We've got SDA, this is our data signal, and we've got SCL, that's our clock signal. Now, remember, everything's a logic one. As long as nobody's switches are closed, everything is a logic one. Now, the controller that wants to talk brings SDA low first. And then after that, it brings SCL low. Now, this kind of, this, this, this voltage change on those two signal lines indicates to all the peripherals, oh, somebody's about to ask for something. I have to see if it's me. If it's me is identified by this address frame. So the address frame, what we're gonna do is we are going to send, starting with the most significant bit, an address. So it's a seven bit address. So I have A6, A5, A4, A3, A2, A1, and A0. So I've got my seven bit address. Now you might think seven bits, cool. I can have up to 128 
That's how many patterns of ones and zeros I can have with seven bits, right? I can have up to 128 different devices hanging off of this, this, uh, this, address, this, this bus. Well, it turns out a couple of them are reserved. I'm going to talk about it in a minute, what, the, you know, what those reserved values are. This next bit is read-write. We have to tell the device that we're communicating with, are we reading or are we writing? Well, if the read-write is equal to a 1, that identifies that the controller is reading. It's asking for data. It's requesting data to come from the uh, peripheral. If read-write is equal to a 0, the controller is writing. All right. So that's at least telling us the direction of the data. So we have the address, the seven bits of address, and the read-write. What goes in this ninth bit? Well, this ninth bit is what we call an acknowledge. All right. Now, an acknowledge bit is coming from whoever's being addressed. So I'm a peripheral. I see my I see this seven bits of address. If that's not me, I don't close my switch. I don't send back a zero or anything. What happens though if I have the address, if my address matches those seven bits, then I say, whoo, it's me. I pull my signal low. I close my switch in order to identify that I have received it. I'm ready for us to do the next bit of the transaction. So what should happen from the point of the view of the of the um, of the controller is it should see a zero there to represent an acknowledgement that yes, I got what I was looking for. So this, I don't know, we'll just put patterns of ones and zeros here, all right? And then we have either a read or a write. Let's say that we're gonna go ahead and read, then we get a zero. All right, so you've got some pattern of ones and zeros. How do we get it, get it so that the peripheral knows when to read those bits? It's the clock. And so you get a clock pulse in the middle of every single one of the bits to tell all the peripherals, read now, read this bit now, read this bit now, okay? So that's really kind of what the signal looks like. Now, this clock signal is going to stay low between frames, but the, uh, the data line will go high for a minute just to give everybody a chance to go, okay, when it goes low, I know that the next frame is coming. So I've got a low then. This low identifies that a frame is coming. Now let's assume, and, and I did it so that the controller is reading, but of course what you're gonna get is a frame similarly if the controller is writing. It just depends on whether the controller is sending the data or the controller is reading the data. Now, we, after this goes low, we get data bit seven, data bit six, data bit five, data bit four, data bit three, data bit two, data bit one, data bit zero. And we've got our pulses coming from the processor, or the controller, excuse me, to identify when to read or send those bits. And so a frame following our address frame is going to be the data that's being passed back and forth. And then we've got an additional bit right here, which is the acknowledgement for that frame. And you get a clock pulse. All right, now, how does all the current transaction end? Well, notice the key thing here is that in between frames, my clock stays low. I can make SDA go high and then goes to zero to say that the next frame is coming. That can continue on until I've passed all the data that I'm going to pass. Well, how do we know that a transaction is complete? Well, the way we know that a transaction is complete is that the controller raises the clock and then raises the data line. So that process of first clock goes high, then data line goes high, that identifies that we are done with the transaction. All right, now let's talk a little bit about addressing. Turns out that in 1992, there was a new specification that allowed for 10-bit addresses. 10-bit addresses. That means that we could have 1,024, right? Many, many more addresses that are available. 
Well, once again, with the stipulation that some of them are reserved. Now, how do you fit 10 bits into this? Well, you can't. What you have to do is send a second frame. So let's make some room on the board, figure out how these 10 bits are set. So let's divide up our board into, let's see, we've got four, five, okay, into our frames. So we've got one frame, two frames. And remember, what we've got is SDA and SCL, the clock and the data. And just like all the other frames, for 10 frames, we now, for excuse me, for 10-bit addresses, we now have two frames for the addresses. SDA comes low, followed by SCL going low. And the way we work this is that we have the bit pattern 11110. It's just always that way. This pattern identifies that we are going to get a 10-bit address. That means that we have reserved all the addresses that begin with 11110. Those cannot be used by any 7-bit device because they're being reserved to identify the beginning of a 10-bit address. That takes care of four addresses. Now, the next two address bits, or the next two bits, our address bits, A9 and A8. So those two bits right there, everybody who is 10-bit address enabled, they look at those two bits to see if it equals their first two bits. If so, they have to pay attention. If not, they don't pay attention. They just ignore the rest of the message, the rest of the frames. The next bit, remember with a single frame, if I have a single address frame, that next bit was going to be my read write. That's the one that says if there's a one there, processor or the controller's reading. If there's a zero there, the processor or the controller is writing. This next position is the acknowledgement, okay? Now, everybody, Remember, this is an open collector circuit, so everybody whose first two bits of their 10-bit address match A9 and A8, everybody pulls down their, they close their switch. Everybody pulls down their signal so that the processor knows we at least have one device that matches those first two bits. And then we have our clock signal, of course, right? So our clock signal is pulsing along here to synchronize all the peripheral devices, everybody that's listening with our data bits or our bits. The clock line stays low then, because remember if the clock line goes high and stays high, that's the end of transmission. So it stays low. And then our SDA goes high, indicating that we're about to send another frame. And then this next frame just gives us the rest of the address bits. We already know the read-write direction. We already know the acknowledgement. We already see the acknowledgement. And so we get A7, A6, A5, A4, A3, A2, A1, A0. Next bit. What's the last bit in every frame? An acknowledgement. And we need this second acknowledgement because the first acknowledgement came from everybody that matched A9 and A8. This acknowledgement comes from the unique device, the one device for all of those, where all of those bits match. And then of course you have the pulses of the clock. All right. Now there are a couple of things that we need to add whenever it comes to the I squared C. Um, protocol. One of the things that we want to talk about is the fact that, well, the peripheral devices, they need to have a little bit of control in terms of this communication. And it does have a little bit of control with this thing referred to as clock stretching. All right. Now, what clock stretching is, is the ability for the peripheral to say, hang on a second, slow up a second, I, I need time to kind of gather the next byte of data I'm going to send you, and so forth. So if you're looking at your SDA line and your SCL lines, those guys, well, let's just say that I've got some data here. I'm sending, I don't know, we've got the last, the last couple of bits. How about D2, D1, D0, all right? Now, 
Let's assume that the, pro the controller is sending data. What does it expect right here? Well, of course, it expects an acknowledgement. It's getting the clock to pulse, right? Now, when the clock pulses for the last bit, the peripheral can actually hold the clock down. And what happens when the clock is held down? Well, even if the controller releases that line in order to get the clock to pulse, it's being held down by the peripheral. So it is possible for the peripheral to hold the clock. And it'll hold it until it's ready to send an acknowledgement. So it sends the zero, it sends the acknowledgement, and lets go of the line. The master can then pulse that line, and it knows that, okay, it, it, I was getting ahead of it, I was getting too fast, nah, but I do know that that data has been received, all right? Now there's one more thing that I'd like to talk about before we close up this discussion on I squared C. Collisions. What is a collision? Well, remember, we can have two controllers on, we can have multiple controllers on this I squared C bus. Because of that, it is possible that two devices could be sending data, two controllers could be sending data or sending frames at the same time. If that happens, we have to have a way of recognizing that two frames are being sent so that the peripherals don't get corrupted data. Let's assume that controller A is trying to send data to an address 1101001, okay, seven bit address. And controller B is trying to send a 1100100, okay, two seven bit addresses. Now, both of these devices, both controller A and controller B, are watch. Not only are they sending data out on their SDA lines, not only are they creating the frames on their SDA lines, they're also watching those lines. Why? Because they want to see if what they're sending matches what's on that line, matches what they're reading. And so for this first bit, if they both start transmitting at exactly the same time, for this first bit, they both transmit a one, they both read their SDA lines, see that there's a one out there. Everything's fine. Once again, they both transmit a one, they both see a one, everything's fine. They both transmit a zero by closing their switches, they both see a zero, everything is fine. But in this fourth bit here, this fourth address bit here, controller B keeps its switch closed, but controller A opens its switch intending to send a one. When they read it, controller B sees a zero. It thinks everything's fine. Controller A, however, reads a zero, but it thinks it was supposed to be sending a one. So at this point, A detects a collision. And what it does is it backs off. It just lets go, it lets controller B or whoever else, whatever contro controller had access to this or whatever controller it had a collision with, it lets it have the line. Controller B doesn't even know anything is happening. Controller A detects, backs off, all right? Now, this works except what if they happen to both be writing data to the same device? Well, if they both happen to be writing data to the same device, so you have A and B, and you still have the, you know, maybe you're doing the same address. So no collision detected. Is that a problem? Well, when they start sending the data, when the data starts going out to that peripheral, if the data is also exactly the same, then the peripheral is receiving exactly the same data. It's just receiving, receiving it just once as opposed to twice if it were to send as two individual frames from two different controllers. But if the data is different, the same thing happens but based on the resolution of the collision between A and B, it, it's whoever sending a one when the other device is sending a zero in the data, it then says, oh, I didn't realize there's a collision going on. I'm going to back off and let the other device have the, have the, um, have the, the bus. Now, 
How does this work when you're reading? Well, reading is the one case where you might have a problem. If both devices are sending data to the exact same peripheral, or excuse me, reading data from the exact same peripheral, so remember that you have the read-write bit following here. If they both are reading, then the peripheral just goes ahead and sends the data and there is no collision detected. That may not be a problem, for example, if you're reading from a, temp a temperature device but it may cause a problem with other devices, more intelligent devices that are out there, such as LCD displays and so forth. So there you go, a simple protocol, the I squared C protocol, that allows us to communicate to multiple peripherals from multiple controllers. It has a couple of drawbacks. It's not as fast as SPI, and because of the complex addressing in the protocol, the, con the peripherals are a little bit more complicated. But it is very popular and is a great way to communicate to multiple devices in your embedded or IoT solution.